I want to do a, <coughs> an overview of uh, Native life in South Africa. Uh, just to kind of put it in context. Native life in South Africa uh, by Saul Platji, this book here that I assigned you guys several weeks ago, is one of the most important books in uh, South African history and also is uh, one of the most important books in the political history in the, and really in the political life of South Africa. Uh, Saul Platji uh, was a member of the Baralong ethnic group. Uh, that's a, a, a Sutu speaking group. Uh, he was from that area around, um, um, oh, you know, around the diamond digging area around Kimberley. As a matter of fact, he worked in Kimberley as a translator and a court uh, translator and, and worked for business. Uh, he had gotten an education. Uh, through uh, mission schools. And uh, he became, you know, he was one of the early uh, black professionals in industrial South Africa. Not, you know, as I said before, he was able to get a lot of work because he had great linguistic skills. He spoke Dutch, he spoke German, he spoke English. Uh, he spoke any number of African languages, uh, Zulu, Osa, uh, Sutu languages, uh, you know, Swana, uh, you know, any, any, you know, just about anything he could speak. Now, now actually, nowadays, the interesting thing about that's actually a pretty common thing in South Africa these days. If you go to modern South Africa, it's really common to run into uh, black South Africans who can speak 10 languages, uh, you know, usually English, Afrikaans and uh, uh, any number of, uh, of of local African languages. Um. Uh, The life of Saul Platzi, Plat, Platji, uh, Platji really reflected of what was going on with uh, the black South Africans. You know, as uh, mentioned before, you know, when uh, diamonds first were discovered, uh, it was a free-for-all. You know, Africans, you know, uh, local black Africans, uh, whites, you know, whether they were Afrikaners or British or uh, other people who had just immigrated there, Everybody was going in trying to get into diamonds. Now, eventually, Africans were forced out of owning diamonds. They were forced into the position of being laborers. Now, that being said, uh, this still was not a bad position for Africans because a lot of Africans simply worked in the diamond mines, made the money they wanted to make, and then they went back home with, with, the, with the money they had. They were able to buy cattle. Young, young men could buy cattle. They could marry more easily. Uh, they could buy guns, which meant that they could more effectively defend their land. And uh, also the other thing, too, is that a number of black Africans uh, who were farmers made money uh, providing food uh, to miners and to uh, whites who lived in the cities. And so the important thing to understand is that uh, Africans actually benefited economically. Uh, from the introduction of mining into South Africa. Uh, Africans benefited economically from urbanization in South Africa. Uh, I think it's really important to understand that, you know, Africans w were quite competitive economically. You know, they were, you know, they understood that they could uh, compete and make a profit, you know, even though they weren't in power. I mean, uh, Africans realized that they weren't going to defeat the British uh, they could still put up a pretty good fight with the Afrikaners, but they realized they weren't going to defeat the British. But they were more than willing to make money. I mean, you have to realize these folks did not come from democratic societies. And so the idea that somebody else was in power and they weren't didn't necessarily bother them that much. You know, they just went on and made money. But what happens is that uh, over time, it becomes clear that uh, the British government, as well as the Afrikaners, did not want uh, black South Africans uh, to, to have a competitive role in the economy. They wanted to reduce black South Africans to the role of only being, uh, only being labor. 
And so we see that, especially with, with the uh, discovery of gold and the Witzvaters ran, that policies are pursued that pretty much force Africans into being labor only. And, and eventually these, these labor uh, camps are, are, are turned into dormitories. Uh, Africans uh, lose their freedom of movement. Uh, once they sign a contract, they have to stay in a dorm for a fixed amount of time. They only have limited visits back home. And so although the Africans remain wage laborers, the conditions under which they work are not free conditions. I mean, they're conditions that uh, verge on servitude, you know, even though they are given monetary compensation for the work they do. Now, the key thing to understand is that the South African War, you know, the war that used to be referred to as the Boer War from 1898 to 1902 was a key turning point in South African history. Uh, it was a pretty nasty war, pretty bitter war. I've already talked about that. And the British were able to defeat the Afrikaners and to uh, incorporate South Africa thoroughly into the uh, British into the British Empire. However, the British had made the, they made the strategic decision that South Africa was going to be a society in which whites had political power, in which whites had access to military power, and in which whites also had access to the prime economic power. This meant that black workers, blacks were going to be reduced only to the role of workers. And importantly, that uh, the colonial government, as well as Africaners, decided they wanted to minimize Western influence in African communities. Now, really, the thing that you have to understand that this was basically like trying to get milk back in a cow. Uh, you know, Westerners had been in South Africa by this time, a couple of hundred years. Uh, the, you know, a large percentage of Africans spoke European languages. Uh, by the time you get to 1900, a, a significant percentage of South Africans have left South Africa and had received education outside of South Africa. Uh, some, a lot of them had gone to Europe. A, 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 a smaller percentage had gone to the United States and gotten education in the United States. Matter of fact, the, the, the next book that we read, uh, the book on Alfred Thuma, is going to be a book about a young man who, who uh, around about the time that we're talking about, uh, when, when Native Life in South Africa was written, is a young man who ends up going to Tuskegee University in Alabama and a number of other schools uh, to get education and eventually comes back to South Africa as a physician. And so really the idea of Africans, you know, really just living a traditional African life uh, was really a, a fantasy. It wasn't going to happen. Uh, and, but it was a, a, a justification that could be used uh, to deny <clears throat> Africans full economic participation. Now, the uh, Native, Native uh, Lands Act of South Africa is really crucial because what it does is that it restricts African access to land only to a number of uh, areas that are reserved for them. It restricts African access to land to reserved territories. This has the effect of meaning that Africans lose access to over 80%, you know, really to over 85% of the land in their native country. Now, there were a number of justifications used for this. Now, the most significant one goes back to the whole time of the Infocani, uh, when they argue that especially like the Afrikaners argue that when they came, uh, for instance, into KwaZulu-Natal and to a number of other areas, that they really didn't run into any black Africans. Now, uh, we now know now that this was largely a byproduct of the fact that this was a period of conflict and a lot of people were not living openly because uh, they were in fear of being raided. Excuse me. 
But be that as it may, it was a, a rationale used to deprive people of land. Now, the effect of the Native Land Act of South Africa, and for those of you all who've read the book, you know this by now, is that Africans uh, who had long-standing titles of land uh, often were taken away from land. And, and also even Africans who had lost their land uh, to Europeans and who had been sharecroppers. Now, they had lost the, the right to become sharecroppers because under the Land Act, Africans could not rent land uh, uh, outside of uh, their reserve areas. And so this meant that, you know, even the sharecropping situation that you have in the United States, uh, which, you know, historically was seen as, has been seen as very unfair and exploitative, Africans in South Africa were not allowed to even have that. An African could only be a servant on a farm to a white farmer. An African did not have a right to be a sharecropper and get a share of the crop. Or, you know, because, you know, being a sharecropper meant that you had control over X acres or hectares of land, however you want to, uh, however you want to measure land. And that they would have access to uh, the crop that was being produced there. And so the Native Lands Act takes that away. And so what we see, especially in the first part of the book, is that Plotji talks about, in some of the earlier chapters, he talks about how Africans are forced off the land, how African livestock ends up starving uh, because they are not allowed to graze their animals on land anymore. You know, the land that they had just previously owned, animals die of thirst because they're not allowed to get water. And it's also significant to note that white farmers uh, who leased land or who sh or to, to, to blacks who uh, had sharecropping arrangements uh, had, were broken the, had broken the law and they could be prosecuted. And so this really, and, and Plotchy talks about this, this really was upsetting to uh, a fair number of farmers who had gotten used to having uh, sharecropping arrangements uh, with black farmers. Now, the Native Lands Act was written in 1913. You know, the, the uh, South African War ended in 1902. Uh, the negotiations that resulted in the Union of South Africa occurred in 1910. And so by 1910, uh, the political agreement has been uh, reached in South Africa that political power would be in the hands of white men because no, no women, would, no, women would not vote in South Africa for a very long time. Uh, and that, you know, like I said, political power would be in the hands of white men. And that the only area in which blacks would have any political power would be in, in, in the uh, Cape, you know, in the Western Cape. Uh, uh, you know, in the Cape province, because traditionally, well, actually at this time, it wasn't the Western Cape. It was just the Cape that included, you know, what is now Western and Eastern Cape provinces in modern day South Africa. But in that area, blacks had, been, had, had managed to get the vote back in 1833 uh, uh, when uh, slavery ended. You know, the laws had been passed that allowed uh, blacks to vote, you know, if they met certain property qualifications. But it was made clear in the, in, 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 the, in the Union Act of 1910 that in the negotiations that this uh, democratic practice would not spread outside of the Cape, that, you know, only local uh, legislatures could pass that. And, you know, the odds of that happening were like slim and none or really or just a whole lot of none. It wasn't even slim. And so it was clear that, you know, political options for blacks would be limited. And eventually, the black vote in the Cape would be undone by 1936. And so what we see in this environment is that Africans get together and they uh, found what is becomes known as the South African Natives uh, National Congress. Uh, this would eventually, uh, over time, develop into the ANC, uh, what nowadays is known as the African National Congress, uh, which has been the biggest party in South Africa since the end of apartheid. <clears throat> uh, you know, every uh, government in South Africa since 19, 
1994 has been dominated by the African National Congress. And so the Af African National Congress, uh, it has its start in 1912, you know, this period, uh, you know, after the Union of South Africa. Now, the, as I said before, the Native Land Act passes in 1913. The significance of this is that this is one year before World War I. Now, South Africa becomes an important player in World War I uh, because of geography. Uh, the, the, the German colony of Southwest Africa, modern-day Namibia, was next door to South Africa. It's, it was on South Africa's, north, South Africa's northwestern border. And so because of this, uh, South African troops, uh, both... Uh, English speaking and, and Afrikaans speaking, you know, become really critical in the war effort. Now, the significant thing here is that by and large, Africans were not allowed to fight in the war. You know, even though Africans had previously fought in combat, although, you know, uh, by, by the time you get to the uh, South African War, Africans are, are, are pretty much forced out. But prior to that, Africans ha had been allies to, to whites, you know, you know, you, you, when you had conflict between the British and the Afrikaners, uh, you know, Afri uh, uh, Africans had been allies to the British and helped, and helped them fight the Afrikaners. Afrikaners themselves, when they fought other Africans, uh, when they fought, you know, other black African communities, often had black allies who helped them fight against uh, other Africans. And so, you know, in World War I, you, you had lots of Africans who were old enough to remember uh, when they, when either they fought in wars or their, or their fathers fought in wars. And as Sal Plachi talks about, you know, outside of South Africa proper in Botswana, and what nowadays is Botswana, which was Bekwana land at that time, uh, you still had Africans, you know, fighting uh, in, in, you know, in World War I. But by and large, this, this has stopped. And so what we see with Sal Plachi, Sal Plachi, he writes Native Life in South Africa. Now, the thing about Native life in South Africa, uh, it's really important to understand what the goal of this book is. Now, South Af Native life in South Africa, I argue, is a polemic. That's a word, P-O-L-E-M-I-C. P-O-L-E-M-I-C, polemic. Now, a polemic is a, a book or an article, uh, essay, whatever, in this case, a, a pretty big book, that is written to argue a political point. Now, I would argue that Native life in South Africa is not an extreme polemic. I mean, there are some polemics that uh, drive home the point so powerfully that, you know, they almost become parody. Uh, Native life in South Africa is not at that level. But the book, nevertheless, was designed uh, to drive home the point that the Native Lands Act was inherently wrong and that one of the reasons why it was such a bad thing is that black South Africans had been very loyal to the British. Uh, Saul Plachi argued, and, and he was telling the truth, that, you know, look, Britain has fought wars against the Afrikaners. I mean, even in World War I, there were Afrikaners who went over to the German side. You know, they, they you know, were very much bitterly opposed to the British, and, you know, whenever they got a chance, they fought against the British. And so Plagi, what he argues out through the whole time, look, you know, Africans are loyal. Now, this is very significant because Plagi ends up going to Britain during the war. And he, you know, gets the book put out in Britain, you know, to try to convince people in Britain that the policy of denying uh, citizenship rights and civil rights to black Africans was wrong. Now, needless to say, Platt G was not successful in his argument. Uh, World War I was at the end of the high point of colonialism and 
the thing about colonialism is that there was very much an, a, an assumption of superiority. That, you know, to use the words of Rudyard Kipling, that white people had to uh, carry on what Rudyard Kipling referred to as the white man's burden, which basically said that, you know, whites were superior, they, had, they were superior people, and that it was their job to bring civilization uh, to people at lesser stages of development. And so ultimately, uh, Native life in South Africa is not successful in terms of uh, convincing the British population that they should support uh, equality in South Africa. However, this is very important. Native life in South Africa really crystallizes the argument for equality. And the ideas of, of, of Native life in South Africa would be a founding part of the political ideology that would eventually, you know, result in the uh, African National Congress. Now, the other thing that's really significant about Native life in South Africa is that Sal Plotji's method of argument, you know, writing the reasonable essay, you know, uh, appealing to government authorities, being peaceful, uh, you know, not even protesting, but, you know, basically putting out a logical argument for justice and appealing to... Uh, the sense of morality in people in charge, this would be the primary method of African protest uh, for a generation. You know, really from 1913 to 1948, and, you know, in, into the 1950s, uh, the idea of uh, writing, oh yeah, I'd say really 1948, yeah, the idea of writing and, and, and uh, making an argument to the government for a better treatment uh, would really be at the crux of the African approach for equality. Now, what we will see when we get to the book on Alfred B. Kuma is that this will change. You know, ultimately, they'll get to the Africans will get to the point where they say, you know, look, appealing to the better angels only works if people have better angels. And so that approach eventually dies. But Sal Plachi is still a crucial person because he gets the ball rolling. He's the first, you know, even though he is not successful, even though he dies, uh, not seeing success for his approach, he makes a big difference. Now, I will say this in terms of the book, that there are a lot of examples of different people in the book. There are people, uh, Saul Plachi talks about how the, the Natives Land Act affects different African communities. Uh, you know, he has contact with... Uh, the African People's Organization, you know, there's a part of the book where they talk about them, uh, which is a which is a colored organization, uh, you know, based in Cape Town. Uh, he has testimony from different groups in different parts of South Africa, and uh, you know, really, his book really does a great job of giving an overview of what South Africa is like at that time. He also talks about people, and I won't name names because it's your job to read the book and figure this out for questions. Uh, some Africans who uh, were, were sellouts, you know, people who were willing to take money or whatever and and, and help uh, in the uh, domination of their people. And so from that standpoint, excuse me, uh, you know, not only is it an important piece of political history, it also is a good uh, primary source, you know, telling you what life was like at that time. Well, anyway, class, I hope this uh, quick lecture helps put the book in better perspective for you. Uh, I'm, I'm publishing your test today. I'm, I'm giving this lecture today on the 20th of October, and I hope this information helps you and at least helps you put the book in a better perspective while you're looking at it and while you're working on your test. Take care.